Welcome back to the Young Shakespeare Podcast. Today, I have the privilege of talking to a Diderot legend, Wade Mars, who got fourth place in the 2021 and 2020 uh, and 2016. Uh, I did rod, you know, thousand plus mile uh, sled dog race. Super awesome to have him on. Wade, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Wade, it was funny. We were talking before about, you know, cat people or dog people. And I was surprised to find out too, even though you're a sled dog racer or a musher, you've got uh, some cats of your own. Yeah, got a couple of them. My wife brought a couple cats with her when we first got together. So that's yeah. awesome. And I can only imagine like the animals that you're seeing out in the Alaska wilderness. Do you ever come across like moose or, or wolves when you're out there on the trail? Yeah, most most of what we see is moose, um, some foxes, stuff like that. Um, it's pretty rare to see wolves when mushing, but you'll see a lot of their tracks pretty mm -hmm. close by you and stuff um they're pretty good at keeping hidden <laughs> yeah yeah some rare sights to see like uh last year on i did a i seen a lynx and, um seen a wolverine one time and we'll see uh buffalo i seen the buffalo out on uh rowan area there and um a couple times those are pretty cool and uh a lot of stuff like that the bears are luckily hibernating then so we don't have to worry about them but. <laughs> how do your dogs react when you see animals out there in the wilderness they get pretty excited they don't really know the danger of the, <laughs> the whole thing you know so they get they get like oh let's catch them or play or whatever it is you know so i don't think they they quite don't quite grasp the danger of of animals so uh it's actually kind of entertaining for them to see those kind of things it always perks them up and they get you know super interested in what's going on and stuff so crazy so i'd love to talk a little bit about you know during this most recent 2021 uh running of the iditarod fourth place a fantastic you know top five finish what do you think the key was to your success uh this past year um well there's a lot of things obviously you have to have a a good dog team to start with. Um, this year we got a few dogs from other mushers. Uh, we got a couple dogs from some uh, friends of ours named Jessica Clayka and then uh, Joshua Cadzo. And um, those four dogs really helped the group this year a lot. Um, and it's been quite a while since I used dogs from elsewhere. So that was that was different, and, um, but it was really cool to see other other dogs in the group and how they compared and stuff to what we had. And um, but you know, good dogs, tr good training, uh, good uh, uh, feeding program and supplement program and all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, comes together, and then of course a good race plan as well definitely helps. So. Yeah, and I know so many mushers talk about the deep connection working with and raising these dogs. Was that at all a challenge, bringing in new dogs to the team, maybe not knowing them as well? Or were you able to sort of figure out, get a sense or a pulse of, you know, when to push and how to optimally sort of work with them? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of depends on the dog a lot. Um, some dogs, a connection means a lot more than other dogs, especially in certain situations. And um, so both of the dogs that finished with me, uh, two of the four that I borrowed finished with me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, both of those two were supposed to be phenomenal leaders and they, they finished, ran most of the race in the team and, and never really seen lead except for just a little bit. So I think that if we would have had a better bond, it would have been they would have been more willing to do the little extra with leading and stuff like that. But as far as um, the little bit of mushing we did do with them, they, they did amazing, an amazing job in the team. And just the, a lot of these dogs have such a desire to run. They don't really care too much about what's going on around them. As long as they're being well taken care of they're they're happy to be out there running. So yeah, and I think that's a huge misconception that a lot of people have about these races is that's really from what I've heard from mushers is so many of these dogs, it's, it's what they love to do and they couldn't be more excited to be out there. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's pretty crazy how excited they get to, to get out there and run and um, it's definitely the highlight of their day, you know, you 
you go out and pull out the lines and harnesses to <clears throat> get ready to mush and they just kind of go wild you know <laughs> yeah um, they'll get more excited for that than they will for getting fed and stuff so <laughs> pretty cool yeah what do you what do you think you've learned about dogs over the years you know just working with them day after day so many hours that the regular dog owner might not know about these these creatures um well it's a, the one thing that i can say is having inside dogs compared to having you know these race style dogs versus a pet style dog i guess i should put it um is there like a totally different animal you know um the the inside dogs so they get excited they want to go running we we had a 185 pound irish wolfhound uh as a pet and he always wanted to go mushing you know but he would try to follow us and he'd almost instantly regret it you know just realized he wasn't built for it and stuff so um but they all have that energy they all have that drive that they want to go do something and and exercise you know just like us we want to get out and go do stuff and so i think that all dogs are that way um they they all enjoy you know getting out and getting around even even little dogs you know they like to go explore and they, they might not do it in a working way but they they can do it in a fun way you know so um yeah i think that's that's uh one of my favorite things about dogs is and and always has been as you know i've always loved to go exploring in the woods whether i was walking snowshoeing biking or whatever it is you know and the dogs whether it's a pet dog that's just walking with you or one that's pulling you around or whatever, they always are enjoying that, that uh, time being out and adventurous and stuff. So. Wow. That's incredible. And I can only imagine, you know, the, the connections that you form and the, the bonds you have with these dogs. Are there any, you know, is there a dog or dogs that stick out to you in your memory that you've really particularly formed a connection with or a bond with over the years? Yeah, so that's that's kind of one of the funniest things about these dogs is um, there's some of them that you you form a bond with almost like you would with a pet that you know they'll you can let them loose they'll run with you everywhere you go um, they'll go jump in the lake swimming and all kinds of stuff you know they're just super into that and then there's other ones that are just business you know you. You give them the pets and the attention and they're kind of like leave me alone let's go mushing or <laughs> you know they're... so it's there's there's those ones and it seems like surprisingly the ones that are the best in the races are the ones that are a little bit more standoffish mm. um they just their focus is mushing and race you know running and and that's kind of what their desires and passions are as animals and and so those guys are usually the better racers or the ones that are a little bit more standoffish hmm. um and and so that that part's crazy right so mask is a uh, dog that finished with me at 10 years old last year and she's one that was super connected you know um relationship wise and we brought her to all the schools and all that kind of stuff to visit the kids and she'd have two, 300 kids piled around her in assembly and just loving the attention, nice. you know? Nice. So, but those, those dogs are a little bit harder to come by with the, with the breed we have, you know, most of them are a little bit more standoffish than <laughs> letting a whole school full of kids pile around them, you know? Yeah. I'd imagine. <laughs> but, um, but they are all really good. You know, they're, they're all friendly. You know, we don't have any that that are uh, mean or anything like that. They all they all like people, and um, you know, kids can go up to them, pet them, whatever, and strangers. And most of them are really really good about it. And some are a little shy. Some will jump right on your chest and knock you down. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You know, besides like the mentality you're describing here. Um, is there any other ways like attributes or things that you can see to tell if a dog's, you know, got sort of the chops or that they're going to be able to make it as a successful, you know, Iditarod racer? Are there certain attributes or things you look for? Yeah. So we start training the dogs at about six months old um, and they'll just do little short runs just for fun, learning how to be in the harness, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, so obviously they have to make it through that stage, just being able to do it and wanting to do it and stuff and being excited about it. And that's, you know, the first thing we look for is their excitement for it. Um, Cause we don't want to be doing it with someone that doesn't want to be doing it with us, you know? So, so that's the number one thing we look for. And then um, the number two thing I look for is physical ability. Um, so the dogs have many different ways of running with different gates. Um, so they, you know, they can do like a trot, um, which is kind of smooth back, just moving fluently, or they can do a lope, which is kind of harder driving, trying to run faster. And then um, some dogs have funny gates where they run to the side or they um, do kind of a wobbly thing in the back end kind of thing. And we'll run into those kind of dogs every once in a while. Some people are very particular about how the dogs run. Some people are think it doesn't matter and it's all about you know their desire and their mm. uh, stuff like that. But I'm very picky about the dog being smooth gated and looking nice when it's moving. I feel like they get a lot less injuries and things like that or sorenesses and things like that if they're more smooth moving. Um, and then appetite's really important. Um, these dogs will eat up to like 10,000 calories a day on the race. So um, they have to be, you know, they have to love to eat a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, those are kind of the main things that we look for in the dogs. It's interesting you mentioned the um, the injuries because that's something I've been fascinated in, you know, along with these connections in the dogs. How do you, how are you able to tell, um, you know, as quickly as possible when you're out in the races or in training, if a dog mm -hmm. is injured or if they have some sort of illness, I'm not a dog owner, so I wouldn't really know. Yeah. What are the, what are the signs that you're able to sort of quickly identify if something, something's off with the dog? Well, um, injury wise is pretty simple. Um, it's kind of like your mom watching you walk into a room. She can tell if you're limping or not, even if it's the slightest limp, you know? Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, it's the same kind of thing. We watch these dogs run for, you know, 3000 miles a year, or 4,000 miles a year. Um, we can tell as soon as something changes, um, even a little bit, you know? And so, <clears throat> and that, and usually the way it changes is what indicates the issue, um, whatever it might be. And then, um, so that's how we, we watch for, you know, injuries and stuff. Now, if they're feeling off, they'll usually go off their food first, um, which is usually a good indicator of, of something not being a hundred percent. And then on top of that, um, you know, just not being excited to mush or to eat or anything like that. If their attitude changes, just, just like people, you know, you can tell when something's wrong with someone, mm -hmm. uh, the dogs are, you kind of read them a lot the same way. They just can't speak to you about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then it's interesting how throughout the course of the race, obviously a thousand miles, um, and this is something I don't think I initially knew, but I learned in researching for this interview. It's typical that some dogs will drop off, you know, whether it's they're not feeling well or injury throughout the, the course of the race. Uh, what's yeah. the typical, you know, you know, from the number of dogs you're starting with to what you're finishing with? You know, what are you sort of hoping to hold on to by that end when you're up by the, the coast? You know, how many are you hoping to finish with? Well, we always hope to finish with as many as possible. It just, you know, adds a little power and excitement to the team. And, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's not too big of a deal to finish with nine or 10 dogs. That's usually, I would say 90% of the time I finish with nine or 10 dogs right in there. Um, you know, Dallas CV, he's won the race with six dogs or five dogs finishing in the team, which wow. is, you know, impressive, but if it's the right five dogs, it's going to be just as good as having those few extra, you know, so it's, um, and then if the musher's an athletic person that that can definitely make a big difference when, whenever you're on an uphill slant or whatever, to be able to work and help the team, uh, 
then the need for more dogs is a, lo- a little less as well. So, yeah. And you mentioned Dallas, who I've seen um, you talk um, together with him on videos and stuff. So I assume there's maybe a friendship or some sort of relationship there. You know, what has made Dallas? He's a multiple time uh, winner. Same with his father. You know, what, what do you think makes him um, such a good musher? Well, there's, there's a lot to it. I mean, he's, he's obviously very good with the dogs and um, very good with, with the racing aspect of it and all that kind of stuff and training, getting them prepared and all that kind of stuff. Um, I would say, you know, and, and, and um, it's been mentioned before by both him and his father is the infrastructure that they have is you know beyond what most mushers have Hmm. as far as you know help goes and um they do really well sponsorship wise and tour wise and everything they they are in a very good position that way Hmm. um and i think that helps a lot um in the you know being able to focus on dogs and dog mushing when it's that time and and having other people focus on everything else (laughs) yeah um is definitely a big, a big bonus that they have over a lot of the mushers, I think. Um, And well, they worked really hard to get it. So (laughs) Um, it's definitely not anything that, uh, you know, is unfair or anything. They, you know, they did it. They figured out how to do it and they're doing a good job at it, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. But yeah, I think that, you know, obviously he's a great dog man and got, has great dogs and um has the infrastructure to go with it so it's it's uh, hard to beat that <laughs> yeah yeah they've got those uh giant kennels um another guy i was interested to hear about because i just watched um the documentary on him would be lance mackey he was uh i think one four in a row i think you would have uh you two would have raced uh or come across each other's past maybe a few times what what's he like as a, as a sled dog racer? What's he like, you know, as a person? Oh, Lance, he's a lot of fun. He's a cool, really cool, (laughs) dude. (laughs) Um, really cool dude. I, I really like Lance a lot. Um, yeah, we've, uh, he used to train dogs with my uncle actually before, uh, when I was a really little baby or, um, maybe before I was born there. So he, uh, he's been around the family a long, long time and, um, or we've been around them a long time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a really cool guy. I've spent a little bit of time with him on the trail. Not a lot. Uh, uh seemed like when he was doing good, I was just getting started. And then when I was doing good, he was kind of pushing off a little bit. So, um, never got to spend a lot of time with him out on the trail, but the times that I did get to see him out there, he's always, you know, in good spirits and fun to be around for sure. So. Yeah. What's, what's the community like of, you know, mushers at the Iditarod or just in general, the community at other races, even is it, is it, are people competitive and they don't really speak or are they supportive of each other for the most part? You know, how does it, how does it get during these, you know, t- intense races? Um, (laughs) I mean, honestly, (laughs) everyone's really cool to each other's faces. (laughs) Um, I think, you know, it's, it's hard to get mushers to come together on anything, but, um, because I think we are all competitors and stuff. Um, but, uh, I mean, for the most part, people get, you know, I would say 99% of the mushers get along with one another as far as like, you know, everyday interactions and stuff like that. So especially at the races, everyone usually is pretty cool. Rule that I think was sort of controversial was, and I was I'm referencing the video, I think um, from yeah. 2016, you and Dallas were talking about two-way communication in wake of obviously a tragedy um, that occurred with a snowmobile attack. Um, yeah. How, how did that? How has that been resolved? You know, what what's the rules now on communication from the trail? Um. Uh. Yeah, they we have full communication now between. You know, we can have cell phones, satellite phones, you know, whatever we want to have. So, um, we can have all that 
uh, full two-way communication. So, I mean, it does say something in the rules about not being able to be coached, but I feel like that's kind of, you know, one of those things that just happens now. Yeah. Is it, is it unrealistic to think that no one's going to get any sort of support via communication? Oh, it's completely yeah. unrealistic. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, all you have to do is call home and not even ask anything. And all they, you know, one person has to say like, man, you it's cool. You're catching Dallas or whatever, you know, on this. <laughs> I'm like, Oh wow. I'm going that fast. You know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, like, Oh, did you hear about that huge storm coming up? Oh, maybe yeah. you, you, <laughs> this checkpoint or you, whatever. Right. So that's, you know, it's kind of on that uh, level, I think, it did definitely change a few things, you know, and at least it changed the honest mushers into being able to as well uh, grab information. <laughs> right. Um, so I do believe there was a couple mushers prior to that were getting information anyways, but um, wow, hard to see. So it, it almost leveled the playing field for it, it, it removed the possibility that someone would, you know, poor intentions or dishonest intentions were able to get an upper hand on people doing it the right way right yeah I think it definitely helped even the playing field a little bit for sure and um you know because at the uh there was um a lot of people who carried cell phones prior to them legalizing two-way communication and we had the the one year where it was like absolutely nothing allowed this year and uh, one of the mushers got disqualified for having two-way communication on their uh, iPod and I think you know I think there was the the issue with the accident and the knowledge of seeing how many people had two-way communication that came to the conclusion that we needed to legalize it you know both to even the playing field and to make things safer uh on the trails yeah how has you know beyond that how has the Iditarod changed over the past few decades you're a guy you've been involved in sled dog racing since you're a little little kid um obviously you know times have gotten faster you know just what what, what things have changed over over the years and the Iditarod well, I mean, if we go all the way back to the beginning, a ton has changed, you know, sled designs. Dog, uh, I don't think the dogs have gotten a ton better, but I think with sled designs getting better, um, the the breeding program has been dialed in a little more for maybe a little more specifics to each musher kind of thing rather than just having what you have kind of thing. Um, and then you know our gear itself has lightened up a ton the checkpoints uh there's been a lot of travel in between checkpoints so the trail's always really nice for us um has usually always has a really good base to it at least and we have a really good trail crew that that you know make sure everything's amazing and easy and uh passable anyways maybe not easy <laughs> um, but, <laughs> yeah. but um you know all of those things come together pretty well um so i think a lot of that kind of stuff has changed and then just you know even from lance Mackey's era to today's era the style of mushing or the style of racing has changed a little bit you know like those guys were very into going a long ways, resting not a long time and uh, continuing to move more consistently down the trail as they went. Uh, and nowadays it's a little more lean towards the shorter run, shorter rest, faster pace, but um, not going as far in one setting. Mm. Um, so it, you know, and and some mushers still do it the other the other way, and it, it just kind of depends on everybody's style. But it seems like the ones that are winning uh, are um, are people that are doing the shorter run, shorter rests, and moving a little faster. Yeah, what's the argument in favor of that style versus the older school style, the longer? runs to longer rest what's what's the argument for for these different schools 
Well, um, it's, it's mostly personal preference, I would say. Um, how you prefer to drive the dogs and I think, you know, what your mentality is. And, you know, I have a friend who races and his, if his dogs aren't barking and screaming and excited, he's not, he's not into it either with, you know, if they're not into it mm -hmm. as to where, you know, me personally, I like my dog team, very calm, quiet, just ready and waiting for the command, you know, and then they can show me their excitement while we're moving down the trail kind of thing, you know, yeah. um, they can bark and, and go crazy while we're running. <laughs> um, but while we're sitting, we might as well relax and, and save our energy, you know, so there, even in that there's differences, you know, and so everyone has their different style of training and, and racing. And, but my biggest argument for the difference is, um, we've been breaking records more recently and, and it's been since that change kind of it, that the records have been being broken. Um, even Martin Boozer, when he set the record, uh, a while back and I think it was early 2000s um, that he set the record and he he did it kind of more short run short rest kind of stuff so right one thing um, in in line with sort of the rules and whatnot I was curious to hear about was is there regulations to um sort of the supplements that the dogs can take for performance. I mean, I'd imagine someone's thought or figured out ways like, you know, steroid uses or anything that would, would enhance the dogs. Is there any regulations or rules on that? And, and what sort of, you know, things can the, can the dogs use beyond simple, you know, nutrition and diet to enhance performance? Yeah. Um, we have a full scale drug testing, um, thing that they do and so they drug test all the dogs um, at the starting line it's 100 random and then they do random testing throughout the race mm -hmm. and then they test the entire top 20 group in gnome um, to make sure that there's no drugs on board so pretty much you know there is a, uh, quite a bit of supplementation we can do but it's going to be all natural and stuff like that you know there's no um because it's dogs you know there's no caffeine allowed or anything like that so mm. a lot of the supplements that even we take as as people um we can't transfer over because of that so yeah yeah and then how is the role of you know i imagine you're on your feet for days you're giving commands it's it's active it's challenging is there a role that your own physical fitness plays in in your preparation for iditarod making sure you can be you know, the leader and, and up and at them for, you know, over a week at a time? Yeah, I would say because of how much training we do um, with the dogs, we're anybody who's running, I did a rod that does their own training is in pretty darn good shape to hold on to the sled and do uh -huh. that kind of stuff, you know. Um, the extra physical uh, fitness of yourself does play a role being able to run up hills and ski pole and pump push you know with the foot or um being able to help the dogs i think can play a big role especially in a thousand miles so um physical fitness in that way is very important uh and then i would say more so though it's mental um the mental aspect is is much harder than the physical aspect in a lot of ways on this on the race um you can be pretty lazy other than just keeping the sled upright and driving you can sit down and relax most of the time or just stand there and let the dogs do all the work um so you know physical fitness is kind of on you on you and your preference um but mental is is where it'll really get you sometimes so what percentage or what percentage of the time would you say you or other mushers are spent actively sort of aiding the dogs with, um, you know, the pull or with a push off and, you know, or, or something like that? What, what, how, what percentage of the time are you active in, in those ways and not just standing or sitting on the sled? Yeah, um, it kind of depends on the, the specific area that we're in. Um, 
you know, especially the first couple of days were pretty mellow. Um, the dogs have all the energy and um, power that you need. So you really don't want to help too much and overrun them. Mm. Um, but then when we head up over the, the range, the Alaska range, um, we'll do a lot of running up the mountain, the mountain sides and the bigger hills in there. Um, going across the burn next is probably the most physically challenging run of the whole race. We're just a lot of steep hills early, usually dirt. So you're really um, working hard to keep the sled, you know, in line and everything, keep the dogs slowed down. And then at the same time, you have these huge hills that you end up having to run up. So yeah. um, that run there is kind of a nonstop workout going across. Um, for at least for the first three quarters or so of it. Um, and then surprisingly enough, like, well, there's one big run in the middle of the race you, uh, on, on both routes mm. that is just a lot of big hills, um, either going over to Ruby from Cripple or going over to Shagluck from Iditarod. There's a lot of big hills in those sections. Um, but then the coast surprisingly is filled with a lot of hills. Um, mm. so we're doing a lot of up, uphill running on the coast. Um, I left Unalakleet one time, which is the first checkpoint on the coast and going out of there, I'm looking at my GPS that we carry and the dogs are going like, I don't know, eight miles an hour or something. And I'd get off the sled and run. It was dry tundra that we were running on there's no snow really and uh there's all the little tundra hummock bumps everywhere and um when i would get off the sled and run the dogs would go a mile an hour faster than when i was standing on the sled so oh. in those cases we'll do a lot of running you know just as yeah. much as we possibly can so yeah and along with the discussion of the course how much of it is, you know, oh, it's absolutely clear where we're supposed to be. And how often is it, you know, on this course of a thousand miles, is there ever points where you're, you know, not exactly clear to navigate from point A to point B, or you get off track a little bit? Yeah, for the most part, it's really well marked. Um, and a lot of it, there's only one trail for. So it's pretty pretty straightforward on on the majority of it um in the beginning part of the race there's quite a few turnoffs and stuff and there's been a few people who've missed those turnoffs um or taken the wrong one or whatever and ended up somewhere else but for the most part those are marked pretty well and pretty easy to follow um now probably the most challenging in that way is on the coast if we get into a blizzard or windstorm um where we can't see very far mm -hmm. then that's where we'll, we can run into issues trying to figure out where to go exactly yeah um it, you know on the topic of the long course and whatnot i was wondering is the sleep patterns and you know biological factors the same for humans and the dogs or do you have to consider you know the dogs are going to be more or less tired than me as far as sleep going in like how much sleep do you get over the course of this race you know how much time to rest and is it any different that the dogs you know circadian rhythms and their sleep patterns than than what you require personally well the dogs end up getting a lot more than we do um just because we're doing chores and everything else so you know we'll pull into a checkpoint and get them laid down and sleeping and it might be 30 40 minutes before we're laying down sleeping or more depending upon the checkpoint and what we have going on and then you know eating and everything else so uh and then we you know we get up 30 40 minutes before we're going to leave and get everything pre prepared to leave and then get the dogs ready to go and and then we can leave so we'll get quite a bit less than the dogs will uh get um there is a couple sections on the trail that are flat enough whether it's lakes or the river or whatever that we can sit down and maybe take a short nap if we feel like it so um that is doable but um yeah just uh i would i have a 
I don't know how much sleep we get. Not enough. <laughs> Not enough. Uh, the dogs, the dogs get enough, but <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I would say in the, you know, the most sleep we'll get is on our 24 hour break. We might get a couple, you know, maybe one six hour sleep on that break um, mm -hmm. and maybe a couple twos and fours. Um, and then you know, on our eight hour break, we'll get four hours of sleep. So we get two of those. Um, and then anything that we're stopping, you know, if I stop for an hour and a half, two hours, I can usually get 30 minutes to an hour of sleep. So huh. um, calculate that out all the way through the race. It's not horrible. <laughs> right. Yeah. Explain the, the concept of the 24 hour break. Was that always involved in the race? And you know, how does that, um, how does that work exactly? It's, it's a required break, right? Yeah. So the required breaks are two eights and one twenty four, And, um, I'm not sure exactly when they put those in, but they've been in for a long time. Um, so yeah, the eight, the first, we usually take our 24 first out of the three breaks. Um, and that, that break is really nice for the musher mostly just to catch up and be ready to continue up the trail. Um, I think the dogs could benefit from that or from two twelves or anything else. You know, I don't think they quite need the 24, but it is good for the musher, which is important to keep us healthy as well um, so that we can properly take care of the dogs. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is good. You can definitely get a lot of meals in the dogs if they're eating really good and um, get, a, get good sleep on them so they can kind of catch back up as well, recover from anything they need to recover from and stuff like that. So, and it, and it gives a good chance for the veterinarians. Um, most of the way up the trail, you're seeing a different vet at each checkpoint. Um, so sitting on the 24, it's kind of cool because you can work with the same vets and they can continue to come back and check things if there's any concerns or anything like that. So, so that's always kind of nice to be able to deal with that. Is it a good spectator sport? I mean, are you able, <laughs> are people able to get from, you know, the beginning to other checkpoints to kind of see most of the race or, or how does that work? Are there, are there good roads between some checkpoints and not others to be able to go watch or, or cheer on a there, friend or something? There's no roads um, except for at the start. Um, so pretty much your only access beyond that point is riding a snowmobile throughout the race or taking an airplane uh, from checkpoint to checkpoint. Um, some of the checkpoints have hubs and they'll they, they can fly in commercial flights and they'll have, you know, rentals, hotels or whatever to stay in. Um, and then most of them are only accessible by bush plane. So mm. th there is a couple package deals that I did around works with, you know, some of the local lodges and uh, flight companies and they put together a package from like, you do the Anchorage start and then you fly out to Rainy Pass and uh all that stuff and I, I believe they go up to mcgrath as well and, and watch the race so so there is there is definitely ways to do it but you can't just hop in a car and and go watch that's for sure yeah right um what's your favorite iditarod movie or movie that depicts sled dog racing oh um, well they make a documentary movie every year after iditarod mm -hmm. that's um pretty sometimes pretty epic you know they do a good job on yeah. most of them um fun to watch um and then but you know it's as far as like disney movies and stuff like that i think iron will was probably the most realistic one that was made um and it was that one was pretty good yeah yeah, yeah. i mean i i liked the other ones the snow dogs and uh eight below and that was yeah. pretty cool um i don't know the realisticness of of them you know <laughs> but yeah yeah um, what's like the the least realistic thing that you've seen in in those sort of like disney or or big uh production movies oh uh 
I don't know. They had some pretty funny stuff in that uh, uh, Snow Dogs movie. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting, you know. Um, one of the things in there that always kind of like boggled my mind was they would say, uh, what was it, hook and break or something to stop the dogs. And uh, <laughs> that, that was, was kind of funny. Uh, um, but yeah, I some of their stuff was very po spot on though. You know, they, they um, had them pulling a little VW bug and stuff. That was pretty cool that you know, some of the mushers used to do that around Wasilla, where I'm from, and, yeah. um, uh, you know, turn on the heater and all that nice stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, um, I'd say they, they did a pretty good job for the most part. <laughs> right. Do you ever have, you know, Hollywood people reaching out to you with questions about how to make certain things, you know, in movies realistic or, or do you ever like, yeah, what's the, what's the attention like too, from the work you've done as a, as a racer? No, oh, yeah. um, no, I've never had anyone reach out to me for that kind of stuff. Um, I've had, you know, quite a few people reach out for possible um, reality TV show things that they're working <laughs> on or whatever, but uh, never, never connected on any of those yet. Um, but uh yeah, I mean, it's interesting to how many people know, you know, who you are and stuff like that. Um, that's kind of crazy. You know, you go into the airport or whatever and someone recognizes you. Or um, I would say the, the, the worst part about all of that is I meet a lot of people on the trail. Um, and then I run into them later on. And they're like, man, do you remember me? I was in McGrath. And I'm like, I don't remember <laughs> McGrath. <laughs> I, I wasn't in McGrath. I mean, physically I was. <laughs> um, so, so that happens a lot, you know. Um, meet a lot of people that know who I am, but I can't remember, you know. Is but it, Yeah, is it, is it challenging when you're... Um racing like if someone wants an autograph or a picture but you're trying to you know make up as much time as possible or is the you know time that takes to do sort of irrelevant well the thing of it is, is most of that kind of stuff is across the board you know um if they want my autograph they're going to want dallas's and mitch's and everybody <laughs> else's you know so uh, they're going to be asking them as well and so you know and it's if you can sign your name faster then you'll save a few seconds i guess <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome what did, um, you, what did you make of getting the offers to be a reality star like you feel like kim kardashian well, or or is that not no. as interesting to you <laughs> uh no i definitely don't feel like kim kardashian that's for sure. <laughs> um no, I think, you know, I think it'd be pretty cool to do at some point, but uh, no, definitely nothing that's on the top of my priority list, <laughs> mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but, you know, it's, it is pretty cool. Like Jesse Holmes, uh, my buddy there in Cantwell, he's been on that Life Below Zero for quite a while and stuff. And yeah, it's a great show. Yeah, I I mean, to be honest, I've never watched it, <laughs> um, but I, I think it's really cool for Jesse, you know, and, um, and I've seen previews. It looks pretty, pretty interesting. I'll probably watch it when I get old and uh, I'm not out doing the same stuff, you know, are you, are you wicked busy all the time? Do you just have stuff that you've got to do, you know, managing the kennel and and training and all the different responsibilities yeah so well as we talked earlier i just moved to wisconsin um so things are a little bit different right now uh but in normal year yeah it's just super busy we normally have you know about 40 dogs in the kennel and uh we were building our house so that was always a project and then working on top of that um so it's kind of like having three full-time jobs, you know, wow. <laughs> doing, the, doing the dog mushing and the house building and working. And, but, um, luckily we normally have pretty decent help. Um, my wife's amazing at, uh, 
you know, keeping up, helping me keep up with all the uh, social media aspects and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. And um, we have a couple other people that help us along those lines with the website and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's nice not to have to do way too much focusing on that. Um, I can keep keep my mind on the dog mushing it uh, aspect more and just getting content and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Is it at all a challenge in Wisconsin, whether that's, you know, having snow for less of the year or less of a community um, that understands dog mushing? I don't know about where, you know, is it Wisconsin, are there people around that are also interested in it and involved in uh, mushing or, or is it kind of just you now as opposed to where you were from in Alaska? And is there anything different with like the climate, you know, that the, the snow or anything like that, the temperatures for the dogs, that makes a difference? Yeah, so I've only been down here about a month or a little over a month, so uh, don't have a lot of experience with it quite yet. I do know that they've had, you know, negative 20, 30 below most of the winter up in Alaska, so I'm not missing that too much. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they have had a little bit better conditions for mushing. They've had more snow up there and stuff like that. Right now we have it all melted off yesterday and then we got a couple inches today. So um, still not on a sled yet, just been training them on the ATV. And um, so that's a little bit different. You know, normally I'd be on a sled for quite a while now, mm. um, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and we have a few mushers in the neighborhood here that are pretty, pretty good. Ryan Reddington's right here with me. Um, that's how I ended up in this town where I'm at here and stuff. Uh, him and I grew up together and um, uh, so we've, you know, we've raced together for many years as well and all that kind of stuff. So we've, we've done some training runs together since I've been here and yeah. um, there's some junior mushers around and just a few miles up the roads, a couple other middle distance mushers that do the, the circuit of races down here in the lower 48. So. Yeah. How would you describe the difference between Alaska and the lower 48? (laughs) Um, You know, in Alaska, the difference that I noticed so far is like in Alaska, when I leave the yard dog mushing, I'm heading into the wilderness, Um, you know, exploring the woods, etc. Here, it seems like the trails are built for snowmobilers to go from bar to bar and town to town. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's pretty much just, you know, running town to town and a lot of road crossings and things like that, which is a little bit different for sure, but yeah. it's not bad. Not bad. <laughs> yeah. So did you, you spent up until this point, your whole life in Alaska or, or have you lived yep. anywhere else? Wow. Yeah, I spent a few months in Michigan one time, but that was about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is, you know, what is life like? Obviously it's, it sounds more um, rural and sort of designed differently, but you know, what do you, what do you think the, the pitches or the appeal would be to being in Alaska or, or, or Northern Canada, the Yukon for, for people that have never experienced it? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, you know, way more wildernessy. You'll see a lot more wildlife, I think, although there's a lot of deer around here and stuff that's pretty cool to see. And, um, but yeah, I mean, up there is just a whole nother beast. You know, you can, you can get lost and walk off the road for a half mile and be completely lost or, you know, into the middle of nowhere kind of thing. <laughs> um, so that's kind of cool, you know, and then, uh, seems like here a lot of the land is owned you know private land or or you know stuff like that so uh alaska definitely has a lot more wilderness and Mm. and uh area to explore that's for sure um but uh you know it's pretty one of the good things about here is it's a lot lot cheaper living uh here in wisconsin um compared to alaska so especially with dog sled dogs so yeah, is that because it's, you know, more integrated with supply chains and stuff like that? So it's less challenging to get materials and things you need? Yeah, so the uh, meat that we feed in Alaska it comes from Wisconsin. And wow. um, down here I can buy it for like, I think it's $37, 37 cents a pound. 
and in Alaska, it's like a dollar twenty a pound or something. Wow. Uh, so it's <clears throat> almost a dollar more a pound, yeah, for me. Uh, and then the kibble that we feed, the, the commercial dog food uh, bag here is uh, fifty five dollars or something, and in Alaska, it's seventy four. Mm. So yeah, uh, it's a you know twenty dollar, and we feed with a forty dog kennel or thirty dog kennel. We feed two, a bag a day. So that's, you know, 20 some dollars a day um, in, in kibble. And then, you know, we feed about 20 pounds of meat a day. So that's $20 a day and meat um, extra just to be up there versus here. So uh, it adds up quite a bit over time, you know, that bills here a lot cheaper and everything else. So what's the diet like of a sled dog? Um, well, a meal bucket that we'd feed uh, would consist of two gallons of kibble, um, 10 pounds of beef, like three pounds of beef fat and a, two and a half pounds of uh, beef liver. Um, and then the supplements that we put in as well. Mm -hmm. You ever try the food? No. Um, you had to be a little not, bit curious at some point. I mean, <laughs> the, the meat is not human grade. Um, and they actually put a uh, little bit of charcoal in it just to make sure that people don't eat it. Really? Um, yeah. Wow. Oh, just yeah. because they, they've had people try it before and then they get really sick and, but <laughs> the dogs are a whole nother beast. They don't, they don't mind that at all there. Yeah. A little bit, a little bit of charcoal here or there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what do you, where do you see the direction of sled dog racing and the Iditarod race heading? You know, what do you see the tra tra trajectory or, or the things that are changing? What, how do you, how do you see that playing out in the next few years or decades? Well, it'll all kind of depend on the leadership of Iditarod. And I think I, Iditarod's going to have a huge effect on the races below it always does. Uh, as far as like the middle distance races and stuff below it in mileage, I mean, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so the, the races that are qualifiers for the Iditarod and all that kind of stuff are going to, um, you know, it's, it's going to have a huge effect on those races. So if Iditarod jumps up and, and becomes 10 times better than all those littler races will jump up and become 10 times better as well. I think it'll just kind of follow suit, um, but same vice versa, you know, uh, and the, you know, I did a rod, I think needs to really work on getting more involved with the community and giving back more and things like that. And that would, you know, project them forward a lot. Um, but yeah. And tell me a little bit about your time. Um, you were on the, uh, as being on the board of directors of the Iditarod. And I think you were the president of, or are the president of the IOFC. Uh, was the president was the president yeah so tell me about your sort of leadership roles and what those entailed um you know in those positions yeah I mean it was a pretty crazy time to be in that seat um when I was there there's a lot of stuff going on with um with different things so it was uh it was very involved very um we were very busy all the time with stuff Mm -hmm. I would do a lot of dog runs with headphones in and do my meetings while I was mushing and wow um, so that you know that happened a lot um but they you know it was it was a good thing in a sense and I think you know I've always thought that every musher that's racing in a dog race should be should have to at some point volunteer for a dog race just so that they know what the the other people are doing in return for them um and you know that was kind of my outlook on becoming part of the board was you know maybe i should do my part you know and hmm. and know what these with what these guys are doing for us um but in the time that i was on the board a lot of change happened we got a lot of board members in we uh, just after i got off the board we brought in a new ceo um and we changed a lot of things up there uh personnel wise um while i was on the board we started the you know the musher meet and greet and a couple of those kind of things that got going pretty good uh until covid hit at least 
um so uh yeah i mean it was an it was definitely an interesting time and it was uh i learned a lot about the race and about the people working the race and um i am excited for the new board members and the new ceo i do think that um the iditarod has a lot more potential than what's being used you know and i think it could take some huge steps forward and hopefully these these guys that are in there are the the guys to do that um to move things forward so uh it could be really good we'll yeah see. yeah do you see potential i mean there's obviously limitations in sort of the climate and the need for snow and, and things like that but is there mm -hmm. potential for the work you guys are doing over at Iditarod being more globalized and seeing in other northern climates a lot more um you know the sled dog racing and popularity and things like that yeah so a couple of years ago there was a company uh called krill pets that came out of norway and they're they were kind of seeking uh there's a big thousand or it's not quite as long as i did a rod the fenmark slope it in norway uh it's a pretty big sled dog race over there um i can't remember exactly how long it is 800 miles or something along those lines 500 miles but uh they were kind of looking at trying to bring them all together as a circuit sort of thing almost and i feel like that could be really good for, for bringing attention to other races and bringing attention from overseas and you know to the iditarod and also from here to the Denmark and all those kind of things so i think that you know if you know everything got tied together more more fan interest um one of the things that i think would be you know huge would be uh the iditarod insider could be a lot bigger than it is you know i think um the fact that it's you know we we shared a video on facebook and it had like nine hundred thousand views at wow. the starting one one year when i was on the board and um it was just a live video on facebook up for one day had nine hundred thousand views and just just for the start and then you know we switched over to the insider and we had 9,000 subscriptions, you know? Um, so how many people are willing to pay for it? Not as many, you know, so they're, yeah. So we're losing a huge fan base in that category at the moment. And I do think that I did a rod will figure out how to fix that. You know, I, there's so many people making millions of dollars as YouTubers and all this kind of stuff. And I feel like I did a rod could harness that if they, if they, you know, um if they tried to so uh and so that would help a lot for being globally i think just getting the image out there the videos the content that we have there's so much good content and the, the, yeah, yeah. yeah the insider crew does a phenomenal job you know and the insider's awesome um there's just not a ton of people that are willing to pay 40 dollars to watch uh, <laughs> the insider you know so Right. But if you if you haven't paid for it and watched it, you should because it's pretty pretty awesome. Right. Yeah. During the course of thousand mile race, are you completely locked in the whole time, or are there times when you kind of zone out and think, or like you mentioned with the addition of phones, do people listen to music? You know, where where are your, where is your head at during the loneliest times of the Iditarod? <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the biggest tricks is to keep focused. Um, I've uh, early on in my career, I tried listening to an audio book and I totally like locked into the audio book and forgot to mush for a couple hours. And I like <laughs> going up this hill, just sitting down, and all of a sudden I'm like, wait, I should be running up this hill. What am I doing? You know, and then I realized, man, I haven't ran up any hills in a long time, you know. <laughs> So that was the last time I listened to an audio book mushing for a long time. And then yeah. uh, two years ago, I tried it again. And I was like, well, maybe if I do it in training, I can learn how to, you know, focus on both. And uh, that was actually really cool to be able to, you know, have a book playing and just uh -huh. have your mind completely clear of any like 
you know, negativeness or anything like that. You know, sometimes you just end up over focusing on what's in front of you. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, that dog looks just a little bit funny or oh, that that's happening or this is happening. And you're pretty much just overthinking everything because you're tired and have nothing else to do. So distracting your mind with something a little bit is really good. You know, music. I have a lot of um a lot of good music that's pump up music, you know, get me going on the trail. Um, <laughs> get me excited on those big hilly runs and <laughs> stuff like that. So yeah. Awesome. Well, Wade, I want to thank you so much for coming on the Young Shakespeare podcast. You were a very cool guy with a very cool job, and it has been super awesome to talk with you and learn about the Iditarod, and I want to wish you uh, good luck going forward, and thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me. It was good talking with you, and I uh, hope it uh, hope you do good on your podcast from now on. 100%. All right. Thank you so much to Wade Mars for coming on this edition of the Young Shakespeare podcast. Please like, subscribe, and tune in for uh, more episodes.